Hello again guys, we are going to dive into radical and piecewise functions. So first we'll deal with radical functions, which are the square roots. So our standard square root function here is that y equals radical x. And again, radical is the exact same thing as square root. So obviously square root of 1 is 1. Square root of 4 is 2. Square root of 9 is 3. And we go on up from there. But you see, our line starts to kind of level out because we have to go further and further and further between each set of perfect squares. So then work through the Pearson module until you get to the got it for part one. So the big thing to learn here is what the change uh, is affected by the values inside the radical and the values outside the radical. So if you are uncertain on how this shifts the graph, pause the video and go back into the Pearson module until you can identify does inside the graph, inside the radical go left, right, or up, down, and outside the radical, does it go left, right, or up, down? So the change inside the radical actually moves our graph to the left or the right, but the thing is we have to think about the opposite of what it's actually telling me to do. So if it says um, add 4 to the x, that actually is telling me to go 4 left, and anything outside the radical is an up and down shift. It changes the y-intercept, but that does exactly what it should do, so that tells you to go down by 2. Go ahead and try to draw that graph. And because my drawing skills are oh so terrible, we know that this is the graph shifted left 4 and down 2. So we start at the origin, we shift it left 4, we shift it down 2, and then we draw my, um, it's not exactly a parabola, it's similar to it, um, but we draw this little curve that we'll get very used to drawing. First thing to do is go up 1 over 1, then up 1 over 3 more, and then the gap again keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but then that makes my domain, my possible x values, x starts at a possible negative 4, but cannot go any left from that, so that makes it greater than or equal to negative 4. And the range, all my y values, start at the negative 2, and then go up from there. Go ahead and try practice problems 1 and 2. If you don't want to graph them, you need to at least identify what would be the shift. What is the left-right shift? What's the vertical shift? Um, again, on number 2, what's the horizontal? What's the vertical shift? So when we look inside the radical, we see the x minus 1. Now again, if it's inside the radical, think opposite. So it's more like moving it 1 to the right. And outside the radical, it does exactly what you think. So it'd be 3 down. So I will be back with the graph in un momento. And actually, if we go ahead and look at number 2 as well, the plus 5 inside the radical would tell me to go 5 left. The plus 1 outside would tell me to go 1 up. So then here are both of your graphs. There would be the graph for number one, showing that we went to the right one and down three. And then the graph for number two, we went to the left five and up one. Make sure that that makes sense for you and then work through the Pearson module for problem two. All right, so this is where I get really nerdy because uh, I think the cube root function is really, really cool. So uh, the difference about a cube root is if you plug a negative number in there, you will get a negative number back. So whereas negative numbers don't really work uh, in my square root, it's very hard to deal with those unless I've made some kind of change inside the radical. Uh, here, I'm allowed to use negative numbers. So this is my original cube root function. Looks like a weird little symbol. Um, but again, think about it. The cube root of, let's say, 8. We know the cube root of 8 is 2 times 2 times 2. So the cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. So whether we're at positive 8, positive 2, or negative 8, negative 2, uh, they kind of mirror each other. So then I already gave away the think right here, but yes, we can find the cube root of a negative number. It just spits out a negative number. So go ahead and think about what does the plus 2 outside the radical do here, and then what does that make the domain and the range? All right, so if it's outside the radical, that still is just our vertical change. So remember that our... Um, cube root graph looks like that weird kind of like s looking thing but again because i can't draw it very well i will just do this and show you that this is what our graph would look like same exact graph as the original cube root except it is shifted up by two um, and up here you can see the two other questions posed by the got it it does not affect the domain or range because all it did was shift it up so my domain is still all x values and my range is still all possible y values so 3 is a little bit more difficult here. So you want to think, what happens when I have this 3 out front and it's multiplying by the cube root? What would that do 
to my output values. So every input value that I plug in, I'll get what I would have had from the original cube root function, but then it will be multiplied by three. So think about that either is going to stretch or compact your graph. Then think about over here, what does the minus two inside do and the plus four outside do? Pause the video, think about those. I will be back with the answers. All right, so the three in front that multiplies by your radical, that is actually a stretch factor or an expansion factor. So whereas my original cube root function would have been here, the cube root of one is one, it multiplies that by a factor of three and stretches it up. Same thing over here, it would have been negative one, negative one, multiplies by a factor of three. So everything is gonna look a whole lot bigger. But again, it still does not affect the domain or range. So even in the cube root function, my inside the radical and my outside the radical still do exactly the same. So I'm told to take this graph two to the right and four up. So this would be my graph once I make that shift. Same exact um, shape to the graph because there's no multiplying factor, but it would just shift it to the right and up. So then our next type of function is called a piecewise function. And another name for a piecewise function is actually a step function. We will get to that in just a moment. Um, right now, looking at the absolute value, uh, the big thing about a piecewise function is it changes rules depending on the domain of the function. So notice here are my classifications for the domain. So it's going to be the values of x when x is greater than or equal to zero. However, it's going to be the opposite values of x anytime that x is less than zero, which makes sense when we think about the graph because the graph of the absolute value starts at the origin and then goes up in that direction and up in, well, if I can get the slope of it right, up in that direction. Uh, this is a really poor drawing, but we know that all of my values have to be positive because it's absolute value. Please make sure that you've worked through all of the Pearson module for number four before looking at this because otherwise it won't make sense. So if you have yet to do so, pause, go back and take care of that. Here we see that we have a minus three inside my absolute value and what's convenient about um, my absolute values is it operates under the same rules as the radicals. So think about what would happen if we have the plus three inside my absolute value. What shift would that do to my graph? So if this plus three inside the absolute value is still a horizontal shift and we think the opposite of what we really uh, are being told. So the plus three tells me to actually move it three to the left. So we do that, move my absolute value three to the left, so then it would look something like this, and that makes my negative three the split in the domain. So now you wanna write out two different functions for whether I'm heading to the right of that negative three or whether I'm heading to the left of that negative three. So pause the video, take a second to try those. Uh, write out both of your functions. Think about what is your y-intercept of this function, if this other function were to continue onward, where would its y-intercept be? What are the slopes for both of them? And then what is the domain? So figuring out the equation for the first line should be easier. We see that we have a positive slope of one and that my y-intercept is three. So that is just the line x plus three. And think about the values of x. We know that the negative three is the split, but it needs to be greater than or equal to, because if I plug in a negative three here, I will get negative three plus three being zero, which spits out my y value or my f of x as being zero. So now think really hard about what will the slope be knowing that this here is perpendicular. So what's the perpendicular slope to my positive one? And then what is the y-intercept going to be? So what's the equation? And then what is the domain left to be covered? So if you're having a hard time figuring out the other equation for down here, the other thing you can do is come up top and just think, because this is absolute value, like we were doing when we were solving the absolute value equations, we have to take the complete opposite of everything inside. So the opposite of x is negative x. The opposite of the plus three is the minus three. And then the only domain left to cover is all values of x less than the negative three. So that will go from the negative three, not including it, and head off to the left. And that covers all of my x values in the domain. And I've got my two different graphs because it's the absolute value. Go ahead, try seven and eight on your own, and then come back for the answers. 
Now remember, because we always have to think about the opposite of what's going on inside of here, that makes my domain split at negative one. So I write down the original function x plus one, and that is going to be for all x values greater than or equal to negative one. And then I write down the opposite of the function, so negative x minus one for all x values that are less than negative one. Always realize that this, the value at the split is absorbed or the equal to in my original function. The opposite function does not get the or equal to. First things first, my equal sign keeps getting erased by my smart tab because if I just do a short quick line, uh, it erases it. So make sure that you're putting f of x is equal to these two different functions. So over here on eight, we see that there's no shift. There's no vertical or horizontal shift. The two just changes the steepness. Again, it's like a multiplier, a magnifier. So when we look at our f of x, we're gonna have the initial just two times x, and then we're gonna have the opposite, so the negative two times x, because if my x became negative x and then multiplied by two, it'd just be negative two x. Now again, my domain split is at zero, so this is going to be x greater than or equal to zero, and then my second function is going to be for the x less than zero. So this is where we're talking about the piecewise function that is known as a step function. You can tell that because it looks like stair steps here. Big thing to pay attention to with the domain is that an x value, for this to be a function, an x value cannot be used twice. So since my x value of negative one is used here on the y being negative one, I cannot use that x being negative one again down here where y is equal to negative two because for every input we have exactly one output. So you have to make sure that you don't share any input values in your step function. Make sure that you've worked through the Pearson module for problem five and come back when you get to the got it point after you have tried it. Because this bus, uh, each of these buses can hold a maximum of 50 students, that helps me figure out how I wanna scale my Y, so or my X, sorry, axis. So every 50 students is gonna create a difference, a change in the Y. So then figure out where my um, steps should be. So what we see here is that at no point can I have zero buses. Zero buses would not work unless I have zero students. So if I have zero students, I can have zero buses, but that's it. As soon as I have any students, I need one bus. So I put an open circle on one bus when my X is zero because zero students don't need a bus. But as soon as I go beyond zero students, I do need a bus all the way up until these 50 students. So then I put a closed circle. Then I step up because as soon as I go over 50, I will need another bus. So I put an open circle at my point 52, like 50 for my X, two for my Y value. And then I shade to the right of that with a closed point because 100 students could fit on two buses. And we keep doing this all the way up. So that is all that I have from this lesson. So please make sure that you've worked through all of the Pearson modules and that everything makes sense to you. Complete your um, practice work and come to class ready to take that mastery. And this obviously could keep stair-stepping all the way up. But for our purposes, we'll stop there because we're assuming our school is not, you know, a thousand students. So please let me know if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Aside from that, have a great day.